You're listening to Blue Jays Nation Radio with Cam Lewis and Tyler Uremchuk, a member of the Nation Network of Podcasts. Episode 183 of Blue Jays Nation Radio is brought to you by Botano, the 2023 EGR brand of the year, and your spot if you want to get in on the action for some Blue Jays baseball down the stretch. 19 plus. Please play responsibly. The game starts now at Botano.ca. Coomzy, for the first time in our lifetimes, good shit happened at the trough. Feels good. Feels good. It does. It does. It was uh, not, not what we expected at all. I mean, when we were looking at the remaining schedule, the final two weeks there where they go to Yankee Stadium and then the trough and then they play the Yankees and the Rays at home, we were kind of like, do well in that Yankees series. So you got some room for error at the trough. And then, hey, at least after that, if everything goes poorly, at least you got those six home games. Well, I mean, things went better than we definitely could have really expected. Um, it was only really one, one, I guess, bad Romano appearance away from being a sweep, which would have been, I mean, this isn't accurate, but that would have been the first time the Jays have ever sweeped Tampa in, in the drop. I, I didn't look into this, but I'm just saying that as a fact. I think everyone listening to this would just be like, yep, that sounds yeah. about right. Like, there's no way they've ever swept a series of the drop. Um, but the Jays come through and, like, they didn't just play good ball. Like, there was weird stuff happening, but it was happening for the Jays for the most part, I should say. Um, like, I mean, George Springer hits an inside the park home run that, like, perfectly bounces and trickles to where no one's standing. We had in the first game, Tampa Bay just completely falling apart. In the second game, Tampa Bay completely falls apart as well like they were walking in runs runs on wild pitches all of that stuff it was just a total script flip from what we probably guessed would have happened at over those three games like this team dug deep and i think they showed us that you know a month ago we were talking about this group and being like do they have the jam to like get into the playoffs does it look like they want it enough especially after that sweet or getting swept by the texas rangers it was like do these guys even look like they give a shit but now you kind of look there's emotion after big hits the starting pitchers are getting fired up like they're showing me something they have not shown all season long yeah there there hasn't been this level of of I don't know if I want to call it intensity or what it is, urgency. We mm -hmm. talked about that a few episodes ago, and I'm like, I don't know how these terms really work in baseball where it's not like, a, you know, it's not a not a grind in sport. It's more of a precision sport. So I, I don't mm -hmm. know how those words necessarily work, but I think a lot of people know what we mean when we say they didn't have this same energy in games earlier in the season. And bear in mind, like, you're not going to have the same intensity for a game in mid-late June as you are for a game in late September. But, I, I mean, the way that things went in that series against Texas, the four-game sweep, it looked like, you know, we're at the time where it's it's crunch time and you have to perform better, and it wasn't happening. And you kind of wonder if getting the wheels beaten off of them at home by the Rangers, a team that's kind of supposed to be, like, one of their peers. They're not, you know, the best team in Major League Baseball. They're just a good team. They're just a playoff team. That's a team the Jays could face in the playoffs. And getting the wheels beaten off you by that, someone in your cohort like that, might have woken them up and made them realize, look, like, we're going to have to find another gear. We're going to dig a little bit deeper, or do something a little bit differently in order to, like, win these games and not only, you know, do well in the playoffs, but actually make it in. Because there was a risk there for a minute that, you know, that wasn't going to happen. And now they're playing a completely different style of baseball. This is the, this is the kind of team that... People got excited about seeing in March when they were like, oh, yeah, we're going to do our details properly and we're going to draw a walk and we're going to be able to lay down a bunt and we're going to be able to do this and we're going to be able to do that. We're going to be able to win in a million different ways. That's what we've seen in these series against Boston, New York and Tampa. They're, they're, they, they look like an October team. Seven and three in their last 10 now, and it's propelled them right to the cusp of clinching a playoff spot. We will talk about that a little bit and talk about the fact that really no one seems all too interested in winning the American League West at uh, at the moment, but Brett will have that report in a bit. First, Coomzy, let's zero in on how the Blue Jays won this series with three up, three down. Let's start with the ups. It's a good vibes podcast. And, you know, even over the last two series against New York and Boston when they were winning, we kind of said like, okay, you're winning because you're pitching and your bullpen's good. If guys like Bo and Springer and I mean Vlad started to wake up, but if those guys can get rolling, all of a sudden you'll see the makings of a team that's going to be a very, very hard out come October. And what did we see in this series against Tampa? George Springer, boy, did he ever wake up. He had potentially like the best six minutes I think you can have as a baseball player. Crushes a three-run inside the park home run. 
dials in and just nails a dude at second base. Like that guy thought he had a stand up double Springer threw that thing on a rope and it, he was out by five steps. Um, and then third, you make a diving catch and the guy at third doesn't even tag up like George Springer kind of won that game in the matter of six minutes for them. Yeah, if they were um, if they were assigning wins above replacement points uh, based on just kind of things you did in the game, then George probably would have received at least one for the inside the park home run and then at least one for both of those fielding plays. So but that's why you signed to the contract, man. That's why, like when the Jays um, opened up the books in, in the winter of 2021 to sign this guy, he had played in so many big games with the Houston Astros and really had gotten the job done. He was huge for them in 2017 when they beat the Dodgers. He became, you know, one of the best leadoff hitters of all time after that. And the Jays gave him the big contract. And the hope was when games mean something in September and October, then George Springer is going to be the guy coming up big. And in this Tampa series, specifically in that third game, he really was. That was, I don't know, maybe the most complete game we've seen Springer play. We've seen him make you know, great plays in the outfield before we've seen him, of course, come up with the bat many times. I always think about that one in 2021, his first season here, um, when he hit the go ahead home run against Boston, that was his big, huge first marquee moment um, with the Blue Jays in that season. And then, you know, um, since then there has been moments, but I, I can't remember a game like that one against Tampa where he was like the, 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 the multidimensional player with hitting and defense at the same time. That was uh, that was a $150 million game right there. I like that line there, $150 million game. He was excellent, <laughs> and the guys who hit second and third were just as good in this series. Or When you look at this series as a whole, Bo Bichette picks up a hit in every game, and then in his final at-bat of the series goes yard and an absolute moonshot at that. Like He knew off the bat that it was gone, just based on the angle of it and how far it went, I'm surprised it didn't hit the roof at the trop. Um, but he hammered that. And then also, we got to talk about Vladimir Guerrero Jr. The long ball has come alive for Vladdy. He has his first multi home run game of the season. He picks up three RBIs in this series. And I'll give you a nice little number that I really liked seeing in the first two games. He had four walks in the first two games. Everything about Vladdy early in the season when he had his struggles, or I should say throughout the season when he's had his struggles. It's been his approach, right? He's going up there. He's swinging at garbage. He's down 0-2, 1-2, and then he's swinging to protect, and just nothing good's happening. He's hammering the ball into the ground. You look at this series against Tampa. First two games, he's standing there not swinging the bat. He's going, I know what pitch I want to hit. You can throw it to me, or you can give me first base. And I think in the third game, what we saw is Tampa Bay really hunting for a win, started to throw him the pitches. They were sick of giving him the walks, and he clobbered a couple of baseballs there. Bowen Vlad are waking up. That's going to make this lineup very, very dangerous. Yeah, it really is. I mean, I, I've said this a few times. If if the Jays have those big three guys going at the top of their lineup, couple that with their pitching and their defense, it's going to be really hard to beat this team. And I mean, there are other guys down lower in the lineup, too, who are contributing as well. And one player that I kind of wanted to give some praise to, specifically because it pertains to Vladdy, is Kevin Biggio batting. Uh, cleanup right behind him it's um, it's been a hard spot for the Jays this year to figure out who should be batting behind Vladdy because you want someone that can do some damage you want someone where like you're talking about there if 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 he's drawing walks and getting onto first base then someone who can do something you know send him home with a double hit a dinger but Kevin Biggio's at bats behind Vladdy have been so good he, he doesn't swing at anything outside the zone always willing to draw a walk and I think what what you have now is those two guys back to back with really patient, good approaches. And there's no pitcher out there who wants to walk two guys in a row. So you have to challenge Vladdy because you don't want to go up to Biggio and he's going to draw a walk as well. You don't want to walk back to back guys. And you see that in like two different games in this series. The Jays are scoring runs off of bases loaded walks. Like they're mounting these rallies where it's not even like the other pitchers just completely imploding and throwing the ball all over the place. It's just a perfectly patient approach where everyone's just sitting there waiting for their sweet spot pitch. And man, this is a version of the blue Jays. We saw for maybe what, like two or three weeks in April and didn't see again after that. But this is the team that we were really hoping we were going to see and circling back to Vladdy. This is the reason that he, he, he's been kind of a focal point of criticism during the season. Like no one's saying he's not talented. No one's saying he doesn't have the ability to be a fantastic player. It's just that when you see a, a middling guy with a sub 800 OPS, no matter how many RBIs, whatever's going on, 
you just the expectations are so high because he's so talented. And now you're seeing it right now. He's playing on a bum knee. He's not at 100 percent and he's still having these amazing at bats, smashing the ball into space. So you, you, you can see when Vladdy's doing well, just how good he can be. And that's that makes you understand why the expectations are the way they are. And if he can be anywhere near his best in late September and October, the Jays are going to be a hard team to beat in the playoffs. Yeah, and you mentioned coupling it with the good starts and the good bullpens as well. Um, before we talk about that, I wanted to give an, an honorable mention, or maybe it can be if our first up is Springer, Bow, and Vlad getting real hot, then our second option maybe be some guys lower in the lineup. You talked about Kevin Biggio, but how about the series that Dalton Varsho had? I mean, four hits in that one. He hits a dinger in the final game. He hits a double and a triple as well over the last seven games here he's starting to show some pop couple home runs in 24 at bats his ops is getting up pretty high over a thousand i believe in those last seven games as well if he's swinging a hot bat then again you have a lefty bat in this thing if him and Bijou are there you can start to maybe manipulate a lineup a little bit where other teams are going to have trouble finding arms out of the bullpen and like you know, you won't just be able to, okay, we're bringing in a power left, you're a power right, and we're going to breeze through these three hitters on the Jays. Like, if Varsho and Bijou are hitting, this lineup's incredibly balanced. So those two having a big series was important, too. Yeah, it really is. Like, just after we get we got done saying, like, oh, yeah, the Jays are a good team if they have those big three guys going well. Think of how good they can be if the big three guys are doing what they should be doing. And then you also have a few guys down there really contributing. And speaking of the lefties, too, it looks like Brandon Belt's going to be back from the injured list right away. And the Jays have... Six games left in the regular season, three against the Yankees, three against Tampa, all at home to kind of see, all right, is Brandon Belt good to go? Is he back in the mix? Can he bat, you know, third or fifth or something in the playoffs? Is he going to be a pinch hitter? What What's the situation? So, I mean, uh, the lineup's looking real deep. When you have those three guys going at the top, then it makes it a lot easier because you're only really banking on one or two random guys lower in the order getting hot at the same time, and that's all you need. You get a, get a Varsho and a Biggio going well, then – this lineup suddenly becomes really quite deep. It really could. And then also if Brandon belts back and everyone else stays healthy, you also run into a little bit of who are you, who are you not playing on a day-to-day -day basis? Right. I know those are very, very good problems to have. Um, let's talk a little bit about the one really solid start that they got in this series. And it came from Chris Bassett who pitched into the seventh inning. He only gave up a couple of earned runs. He looked really, really good. Is he like, Let's let's do a little scenario here. Jays make the wild card round. They're playing Minnesota. Is it clear who their three starters are? Is it very obviously Gosman, Barrios, and now Bassett? And have you kind of closed the door on Kikuchi Ryu being one of those arms? I have to look deeper at what Minnesota's splits are. I think if the Jays yeah. are playing the Rays, given the way things went this 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 weekend, they hit both Ryu and Kikuchi pretty hard. And Ryu has had a hard time against the Rays in the past. Think back to 2020 when, you know, he had his dominant season and then got lit up in game two of the wild card series. Um, Kikuchi, again, a lefty. The Rays are a very right-handed, heavy lineup. Um, so it would make sense, I think, if if you're facing Tampa to do Gosman, Barrios, Bassett, and then <clears throat> maybe have Kikuchi as a, a lefty bullpen weapon, someone who can give you some length. I don't know how well Ryu transfers to the bullpen, how much his stuff would work. But, I mean, it's a you know, he throws the ball very differently than Gosman and Barrios do. So it, it could be an interesting gap to bridge if those guys don't give you a long start. But I don't know. The way things are looking now, it really it really does look like the Jays are going to meet up with Tampa in the first round of the playoffs. And if they do, I would go righty, righty, righty. Um, Gosman, Barrios, Bassett, because I think that, that, that the Rays, you know, right-handed heavy lineup would... I don't know, say struggle is the, the term I'd like to use, but they they don't match up particularly well against those three three Blue Jays righties. Third up from that series, just the fact that Chris Bassett was as good as he was in that one, giving you some hope that if there was a playoff series at the Trop, maybe the Jays would be able to get something done. That's really what that those last three games there uh, kind of did. There was also a, a good outing from both Hicks and Romano. Then there was a bad outing from Jordan Romano as well. So I wasn't sure where to slot the bullpen when we did our three up, three down here, Coomzy. But I'll put them in the down column just because of the blown save from Jordan Romano in that game. Is that on him or do you, do you think they should have taken him out of that ball game a little earlier? I don't know. That's a weird situation because you had Romano. He had pitched the day before and then it, it was obvious immediately when he came into pitch on the Saturday 
with the six five lead. He kept looking at his finger. We know all about this with, you know, Aaron Sanchez had a million problems with this. So Blue Jays fans know all about blisters and crack nails and whatnot. So everybody was screaming at their TV to pull him out of the game. But, you know, we saw John Schneider and the trainer go out and talk to him. Romano said, I'm fine. His velocity was there. He he, he was doing what he had to do. It's just, I think sometimes you got to give the, the other team some credit. The Rays are good. And they didn't want to lose the first two games of their series against the Blue Jays with the rookie Taj Bradley coming up on Sunday uh, as the defense they have in the way of a sweep. So, you know, credit to them. They had a really good ninth inning, got the job done. I think if you're Schneider um, and you you take Romano out in that situation and use Tim Meza and you get through it and maybe you win the game, it goes longer, whatever happens. I don't know if that's good for Jordan Romano. Schneider said after the game, he says, um, that's your closer. This is somebody you trust in every situation, no matter what. And that's the role Romano's earned this season. He had only blown three saves in like 37 appearances or whatever it was before that game. So I don't think you 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 try and manage too cute like that. Romano's earned the chance to be the closer. And I think it's it's just better for him as a player to go out and do his thing and lose than it would be to be pulled out of that situation and watch from the bench and have the thought inside of his head be, well, okay, my manager doesn't think that I can get the job done with a slightly broken fingernail. How am I going to pitch deep into October? I think that's a fair point. I, I had no problem with it. Like we've seen Romano get out of jams before. And I think you're right. It would send a weird message this time of the year. If all of a sudden you're like, you know, what, Joe, we don't trust you. The fingernail thing makes it a little bit different, but I don't know. Some it, We know he's, lack of a better uh, term here, he's a dog, man. Like that <laughs> clip of him in the first game, standing in the dugout with his hat like on top of his head, just like staring out into the field. It was like, yeah, that's a guy who I think can pitch through a minor finger issue and get you a couple of big outs. So I, I didn't understand all the outrage about it. It was still a wildly successful series. At the end of the day, you lost that second game, but if we're being honest, it's a game you probably had no business being in when you look at the, how the Rays let you back into it. So it's like... Mm -hmm. If, if it would have been a 5 nothing lead that they blew and then Romano came in and like blew the save too, then I'd be a little bit more pissed. But it's kind of like a, you won two or three at the trop. Let, let's not get too upset about something small here. Um, the second down I have from this series is more of a conversation I want to have about a player. And it's Davis Schneider who has just turned ice cold. He is stuck in the middle of an 0 for 30 slump right now. Um, it's interesting when you look back, and I know it was Codify Baseball on Twitter put together a little montage of some of his hard hit outs over the last couple of weeks while he's been in this slump. I think we all remember the three hits in that game against Boston that came in like the ninth, the tenth, and extra innings, or two of them came in extra innings where he hammered three line drives to all three outfielders, and they just all happened to get caught, right? He had a good hit in New York that got caught as well. Are you worried about him? Are you willing to say, hey, you know, maybe with guys like Belt back, Biggio can play a bit of second to Varsho's your left fielder. Are you, are you comfortable with David Schneider no longer being an everyday Blue Jay? Do you think they should just keep letting him go because it's been a little bit unlucky? Should they keep throwing him in there and hope he gets hot before October? What, what do you think of this slump by Schneider and how should John Schneider handle it? I don't know. I don't think it's the end of the world, really. You mentioned the Codify Baseball thing. There was a, <clears throat> a nice montage video that Schneider's made great contact. And even even during this this poor stretch, he he has a good um, expected numbers. The, he's hitting the ball hard right at guys. And there was also another video that I saw on Twitter. I can't remember who it was, but there was, <laughs> it was showing all of the times Davis Schneider has had a strike that wasn't a strike called a strike. So I think we, what we know about him and his batting is that he's a sweet spot hitter. He'll sit there and largely wait for his pitch in his spot. He doesn't expand and swing out of the zone very much. That's what he was doing when he first came up. And then since the umpires maybe, I guess, decided, hey, look, you're a rookie. We're going to make things hard for you, as they always do. Um, he's had to expand his zone, and now he hasn't been as effective. There's There's tons of strikes called against him that were pretty pretty clearly not about, strikes yeah. and if, if if you're already like a, a a smaller guy who doesn't have a huge swing path and you're having to expand your zone like that you're not going to have a good time so i think the jays would be wise to stick by david schneider and let him continue doing it let him continue 
hack him. I think at the very least, you know, he's he's provided a very good defense at second base, which is interesting because I think it was Keith Law who said um, recently that he didn't believe in Schneider because he doesn't really have a true position. He's not like a plus defender anywhere. But I don't know. I've seen him and Bo Bichette turn some really nice double plays, and I feel very confident in him at second base. So if Biggio is playing first with Vladdy as the DH, they're not comfortable having Vladdy play first because of his knee. Biggio is doing a great job at first. I like Schneider at second, personally. The glove is perfectly fine, but there's a lot of different options the Jays have. There's 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 quite a bit of depth here. There's some young guys who provide a bit of a spark. There's veteran guys, like you said, Brandon Belt's coming back. Whit Merrifield, yeah, as bad as he has been recently, is unreal at the trop, so maybe that's a bat you have to get in. I think these are good problems to have. There's, there's more guys... There's more guys in the mix than that that you'd like to have in the lineup than there are. Oh man, I can't believe this guy's in the lineup. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's fair. Uh, the Blue Jays' magic number to clinch a playoff spot officially is down to three. How did that number once again drop so much over the course <laughs> of a few days? It's a result of the nonsense happening in the AL West. We'll talk about that with Brett, but first we're going to step aside for a quick break. Cruising along on episode 183 of Blue Jays Nation Radio, brought to you by Batano. The out-of-town scoreboard once again broke in a pretty good way for the Toronto Blue Jays. Let's get a sense of how things went down this weekend in the race that nobody wants to win, the American League West. <laughs> Brett Holden is our guy. Again, Brett, we've called this uh, segment many different things. It is once again just the AL West report. You have a mop or a broom of some sorts. Yeah, no, I think we're going to change the name of this segment once again to uh, the AL Sweep Report because every team that are involved with the Blue Jays playoff race in some way was involved in a sweep. Let's start off with the team who actually won their sweep, and that is the Texas Rangers where their win of a sweep over the Seattle Mariners now puts them at the top of the AL West by two and a half games, not just now pumping up a half game or one game or a game and a half. They're up by two and a half games after they swept the uh, Seattle Mariners, as mentioned, Trev uh, Trevor Simeon, Travis, Travis, Trevor, Trevor Simeon. Uh, he gets uh, two homers in the series. You mean There's Marcus Simeon? Marcus yeah, Simeon. you're thinking of you're the quarterback. I've been watching a lot of football. I was watching a lot of football this weekend. And as Trevor Simeon still play? As a Bears fan, we need a new quarterback. So I just have a whole bunch of insecure quarterbacks or obscure quarterbacks <laughs> going. Marcus Simeon, there we go. Uh, had a two run home run game or two home run game. There we go in the series finale. The Rangers head to Los Angeles to face off, face off, excuse me, against the Angels. No Dodgers this time. But let's talk about the Houston Astros. As the Houston Astros, we talked about a couple of times now, just have no business trying to beat or win against bad teams and that happened once again against the Kansas City Royals as the Royals swept the Astros 7-5, 3-2 and 6-5 in the three games. The Houston Astros left 21 runners on base in the series and the Astros gave up 16 runs but none of those runs were scored off of their relievers. They were all scored off of their starters. So starting pitching looking like a problem for the Astros. They go up against the Seattle Mariners in their next series. And speaking of the Mariners, they were the ones who got swept by the Texas Rangers. And Marcus, don't call me Trevor Simeon with his game there they now sit a half game back from Houston and the final wild card spot. And just to kind of tie it all together, those New York Yankees have officially been mathematically eliminated from the playoffs. We love to see that. Now, one thing I do want to mention from something you guys were uh, talking about earlier in the show, and that is winning at the Trop. The last time the Blue Jays swept the Tampa Bay Rays was September 2nd to the 4th, 2014. You want to know the starting winning pitchers in those? It doesn't matter. I'm going to tell you. R.A. Dickey in the first game. Marcus Stroman gets the second win. And Brett Cecil got the win in the series finale in a one nothing game that went to the 10th inning. Casey Jansen 
would go on to have the save in that one. And also, Deonor Navarro had a great series, two homers there. So, and maybe a little bit of a different team than it was back then, but nope. hey, a win at the Trop is a win at the Trop. 100%. The Jays have a big weekend, and the out-of-town scoreboard helps them out as well. Thank you, Brett. No worries. Oh, man. Yeah. So the Jays, I mean, Brett talked about how the Rangers now building themselves up a bit of wiggle room at the top of the AL West standings. I mean, the other thing is you can't even say that they've locked it up because they still have four games against the Seattle Mariners. Like Texas could still very, very easily fall out of this race in that last four game series by themselves. The tough part right now, I mean, maybe I shouldn't say tough. Maybe it's a bit of a curse and a blessing for a team like Seattle. It's three against Houston, four against Texas. Like, you can feel good saying, hey, we control our own destiny. On the other hand, you can sit there and go, we have seven straight, very, very difficult ball games, and they need to go five and two in those ball games to even have a chance of getting in. That's hard. Yeah, that's a that's a difficult situation they built for themselves. But I mean, hey, look at well, sometimes you get swept by the Texas Rangers and everything changes. So it wouldn't at all be shocking if Seattle went and swept the Rangers right away. And given the way Houston's going, would it be that surprising if the Mariners swept them? Like, which of those two teams is going to figure it out? Or are they both just going to find a way to mutually lose the series? Because both of those teams look terrible recently. Yeah, I mean, the good news again for the Jays is just that these teams play each other. So someone... Yeah. One of those three teams is going to lose every single day from now until the end of the regular season. That is just, that's such a big positive for them. So again, good follow on Twitter is Blue Jays magic number. They break it all down really, really nicely. If the Jays get to 90 wins, they are in no matter what. There is also one scenario where the Jays could get in at 89 wins. And that would be if Seattle goes 90 and 72 and Houston finishes with 89 wins, the Jays would clinch the last playoff spot with 89 because of their tiebreaker against the Houston Astros. It's the only team the Jays hold the tiebreaker against. So that's kind of how things are looking as we head into the final week of regular season baseball. If you're a fan of percentages, I got those for you as well. Fan graphs say the Jays have a 97.5% chance of making the postseason. The Astros are down at 60. The Mariners are down at 45.3. The Rangers also like the Jays all the way up at 97% in terms of their playoff chances. So it's looking good right now as the Jays head to a three-game series against the New York Yankees at the Rogers Center, a Yankees team that's been eliminated. You have a day off to get everyone rested. Coomsey, the Jays should really just blow the Yankees out three times, and then all of a sudden that final series of the year will mean nothing. Yeah, if the Jays sweep the Yankees here and they're going to that Tampa series with a record of 90 and 69, then you can spend those three games against Tampa lining up your starters, giving people a break. You know, you can bring out whoever's lined up. Uh, I think it would be Kikuchi and Ryu in those starts, yep. and you could probably not do Gosman on the Sunday because I think he'd be lined up there, get him ready for wild card game one. Uh, it also puts you in a situation where if you want to go into wild card three, you can tank those games and uh, kind of do that with a bit more comfort. But quite honestly, and I mean, I really, really might might regret saying this. This might be a very cursed thing to say, but the more I think about it, the more I think the Jays might actually line up better with Tampa than Minnesota. And I've talked a lot of shit about the Twins and the American League Central all year, but the Twins are playing good recently. And I don't love the idea of the Jays facing their pitching outside in minnesota in october i i maybe i'm just feeling way too good about that that series at the trop but i like toronto's three right-handed pitchers going up against the rays more than i more than i like their bats going up against the twins i think a lot of people would instantly look at the standings and say one of those teams has 12 more wins than the other how no. could you say that but it's what have you done for me lately? We, we've we seen it time and time again in the MLB postseason. Philly last year, Atlanta the year they went on to win it all. Like, if you're hot heading into October, you can beat anyone. Also, it's only a three-game series. It's not like you need to go up against the Rays for seven consecutive games and it'll be this big, long, epic battle of who's got the best depth, whatever. It's three games. Like you said, if your three righties line up good and they kind of shown that they do, why would you not feel confident heading into that series and i think with minnesota there's a little bit of like you said they're seven and three in their last 10 you have to roll in and go play them like 
I know the trop is the trop. Like it doesn't exactly get all that rocking. Like we've seen, remember when they played them? Granted, it was the COVID year, but like there were a lot of empty seats in those playoff games when the Jays went there. And I know they eventually did lose. So I don't know. Maybe, maybe right. Maybe we're riding this high of the series win at the trop a little bit too much, but I'm not as scared of the Rays as I was two weeks ago. No, definitely not. And I mean, I don't know. The, I, I I agree with what you said. If you're if you're hot at the right time, then you can beat anybody. The way the Jays are going right now, they're playing they're playing something along the lines of what they should be playing. Like mm-hmm. the best case scenario for this team, if it works the way it should on paper, is this elite pitching staff because they have a great defense, a deep bullpen, and then a top five lineup in baseball. I, I don't know if it looks exactly like it should look, but they found a way to kind of play to their strengths they're getting the job done they seem confident they seem like they can do it i don't know i don't i don't really feel terrible about the jays going up against anybody right now but we all know how much that can change we can be back here on thursday after a one and two series against new york being like "Ah!" and be so mad about how everything is and be like "Ah, i don't even want them in the playoffs because they're going to lose to anyone so like yeah it is what it is let's enjoy the high right now and say the jays can beat anybody fuck it yeah, I mean, there is a chance. Yeah, they they win one of three here, and we're sitting on Thursday recording the pod going, oh, my God, you have to beat the Rays twice in the final three games to make the playoffs. This is bad. Um, hopefully it doesn't come to that, though. you got Gosman, Barrios, and Bassett all lined up, ready to go in this series against the Yankees. It would be very cool to see the Toronto Blue Jays clinch a playoff spot on home field um, versus in years past when the Yankees have clinched playoff spots at the Rogers Center. That was no fun. Um, all right, Coomzy, that's going to be a wrap for this week's episode of the podcast. I will chat with you again Thursday. Enjoy the games. Best wishes. Thanks for tuning in to Blue Jays Nation Radio. Don't forget to like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from to never miss an episode.